Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Two years on from the start of the Ukraine war, the UK has around half a million refugees. Now, the majority are just not working. At the same time, the UK, we know, has labor shortages across many sectors. So something doesn't really add up. Our guest this week, Hamdi Ulukaya, has a solution. Hamdi was raised in a dairy farming family in a small village in eastern Turkey. And after moving to the US, he launched the yogurt brand Shabani in 2007. Five years later, and Shabani was a billion dollar brand. He's invented the label Anti-CO really because of his approach to leading. He's focused on people rather than profits. He founded a charity called Tent Partnership for Refugees, which also focuses on getting private companies to hire refugees across the globe. And earlier this month, Tent launched its UK coalition, when more than 60 British companies were committed to actively supporting refugees in their workforces. So this week, we're going to hear from Hamdi on what role refugees play in building companies and reviving economies, and what commitment should business leaders be making to hire refugees at this particular moment. Welcome to In the City. From Bloomberg's offices in the heart of the Square Mile, this is our weekly podcast about the stories driving the conversations of policymakers, power brokers and financiers in the power centers the world over. I'm Francine Lacroix and has promised David Merritt back from Hong Kong. Hello, I'm back. (laughs) Jet lagged, suitably jet lagged? No, I don't do, no, I don't get jet lagged. I told you jet lagged. Yeah, that's right. No, Uh, it was a short visit. Your body doesn't know what time zone you're in. Yeah, I have no idea what time zone I'm in. But (laughs) it's always, it's always excellent to be in Hong Kong. Uh, And I realised it was 10 years after I lived there, in fact. So it's always a bit of a homecoming. Dave, from one financial centre to the other, Allegra. Uh, somewhat drowning probably in the readout today. Never drowning. <laughs> Never drowning. Waving. Always on Always top, waving. but busy. <laughs> waving and typing. <laughs> but Dave, look, I'm curious about your trip to Hong Kong. Did you find it different from when you lived there? It probably changed quite a lot. It has changed quite Well, you know, the, the interesting thing that happened in Hong Kong last week was that they passed big security law, or 23 as it's known, was passed in record time in the Hong Kong equivalent of their parliament and has become law on Saturday. And what was amazing to me being there that week was that it really passed without much event or drama on the streets. You know, when I was there back in 2016, of course, millions of people took to the streets any hint of uh, restrictions on people's freedom. So the city is a very different place these days. And it just shows you the effect of the clampdown from China. Interestingly, the, the debate in the UK is around China as Dave nicely teed up, of, of, of stories about China surveillance and espionage and so on. So the revelation today is that the authorities believe that at least four MPs have been systematically spied on. And then quite incredibly, that they had an entire year where they were looking at the Electoral Commission's data on people who registered to vote between 2014 and 2022. So that's been leading the news in the UK papers. But the other thing that we've all been talking about, certainly I've been writing about, is what we've seen in the markets, isn't it, Fran? It's a bit of a funny week because last week we saw a rally in almost everything. It was the everything rally. We saw AI stocks go up. We saw record highs for gold. We saw that for a lot of the US indices. And central banks were quite dovish. BOJ, you know, got out of its 17-year experiments with that huge whipsaw. But you kind of wonder what's next. Are they actually ignoring some of the longer-term problems? Well, that's right. And, you know, because the rest of the news just seems unremittingly grim, doesn't it? Whether it's the events in Moscow uh, or indeed in Ukraine or in Gaza and Israel, the uh, geopolitical situation is in the, some of the euphoria that we're seeing in the markets. And like that, that gulf seems a particularly wide one at the moment, doesn't it? Right. And those conflicts you mentioned, Dave, they also raise questions about what we might see with an increase in migration and therefore an increase in refugees. And actually, that sets us up nicely to this conversation Francine and I had about how, in fact, welcoming immigrants and hiring refugees can be a real benefit to businesses and economies. So let's get to it. Our conversation with Chobani CEO Hamdi Yulakaya. Hamdi, thank you so much for coming to see us here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hamdi, tell us the origin story for Tent. Tent really came out of when I wake up one day, I said, okay, the girls got attacked with ISIS and they kidnapped. These are Kurdish girls, Yazidi girls. I got to do something. And it's just a human reaction. 
until that moment, the refugee topic was never in my head. Now, I hired refugees at Chobani all these years when I started, but I never thought I was doing a refugee work. I was thought, like, you know, people are in the communities, they're looking for work, and I'm hiring everybody, I'm growing, everybody's welcome. I don't see anything to be a blockage from them to enter the work, whether transportation, language, training, we can handle all of that. There's not a big problem. But it wasn't until that moment and realized that this topic is big. Like you're talking about millions of millions of people all around the world. And they're literally stuck. So when was this, Hamdi? This was this ha- is 2015, 2000. So uh, eight years after you founded Chobani. Yeah. And I see some companies that are involved, but literally mostly on humanitarian aid side of things, like donations, which is fine, but there's nothing sustainable. It's basically more protection than getting back to life, which is protection is important. But then you see average refugee living in a refugee camp or city and town, 19, 20 years. Some of them, they never leave. Wasted life, stuck. And then I make the connection to my experience at Chobani and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Like I had these people come from all kinds of different backgrounds, some of them Asian, African, Middle East. And the minute they get a job, that's the minute they start being a refugee. Not when they get the first protection, it's actually when they get the first job, that's back to life. Dignity, providing their own family. That has enormous amount of effect on my growth at Chobani's success. So it's a win-win. So if I can take this model that happened at Chobani, and if I can expand it, uh, could be something. But you say it's contributed to your success. Tell us how. So refugees often three to five times more likely stay in the job longer than anybody else, like the commitment to job. The effect on productivity or culture or all kinds of stuff that is effective in business, true refugees is enormous. Because you're in touch with human stories. I think one of the most beneficial things that happened at Chobani is how innovative we are. New blood, new innovation, new ideas just floating into it. I had 19 different nationalities, 16 different languages. 30% of them are from all over the world, <laughs> you know. And everybody come together and create this movement, shoulder to shoulder. We make yogurt, we make food, something that we're proud of. And we pride our, provide to our families and we elevate Everyone. Um, do you, why do you think this initiative in the UK actually had more big companies sign up to it? There's a labor shortage in this country. Yeah. Is it because big business and small businesses that have signed up to taking refugees in for the workforce need to look to immigration? 70 companies signing up. I mean, it's massive. You have companies like BP, Pratt, some iconic British companies and as well as international companies. There are a couple of reasons. One is, I think we have 500,000 refugees here in UK ready to work, and half of them being Ukrainians. Then you have people from Hong Kong, people from Afghanistan, some other places. The administration has created pathways for them to be able to access the work. One out of five companies is basically experiencing labor shortages. You're talking about a million people. And, and that's affecting, you know, inflation, affecting productivity. So there is need for work. You know, we saw it in our study. The general public is supporting companies to hire refugees. I mean, it's a scientific market study that we've done at TENT that the vast majority of the people are asking for companies to hire them. If you leave it on political landscape, this issue is never going to find a way to move on. And the reality is, Even if you solve all the conflicts in the world, you're dealing with climate and the migration and refugees are going to happen whether you like it or not. When you talk through the advantages, do you have companies that don't want to do it? And the companies that don't do it, why don't they do it? Uh, There are a couple of answers that come in. And I usually call CEOs and... Offer them some <laughs> coffee, some yogurt. Hey, can we talk about that? Chobani, perhaps. Chobani, yeah, of course. <laughs> Stuff they, know, they know they're in trouble. They know this conversation is going to end one way. <laughs> yogurt is very powerful. And has a CEO, ever, as a fellow CEO, ever said no to you? Yes. Um, and he says, Hamdi, this is not in our priorities. I don't know if our consumers will like it. I don't know if our employees will like it. Some, some. For the vast majority, I think we have inflection point right now. Right after this, I'm having a, 
a meeting with a CEO, a very important CEO of this country. Uh, right now, conviction is 10 minutes, 15 minutes. The, our usually way is away from the cameras, away from everything. We, all of us, we get 15, 20 of us get around the table, break food, and we talk about these things. And we share experiences. And I think CEOs are very pragmatic. The minute they realize what takes, above and beyond of the political landscape, okay, why is the problem? Okay, oh, it is actually happens because of the HR. Your application for someone to join immediately dismisses if somebody doesn't speak the language or doesn't have the way of transportation or whatever it is, training. But if you give a little bit of training, a little bit of investment, it pays off dramatically. So just a little bit of adjustments, empowering the head of people. We also hear from especially chief executives that work in the U.S. that it's actually harder to push social issues onto companies because of the backlash against ESG, because of culture wars, because of what is being said around wokeism. Do, do you feel that? <laughs> you know, this fashion way of looking at companies' involvement with so-called ESG or impact or purpose, it, it is a troubling, really. And we're having a couple of steps forward, a couple of steps backward type of things based on how what happens in economies. If things are bad, the first thing they blame is, oh, you're spend so much time of your time outside of business and wh why are you doing this? And if things are nice, oh, are you going to be relevant tomorrow because the consumer wants you to be involved with environment and humanity and all that kind of stuff? The truth is, if companies committed to this truly on a field, not necessarily on the front, just check the box, from every study, conservative, liberal, whatever, every business study you can look at it, being involved in this type of things, community, social changes, climate, enormously effective success of business. The only difference is, what's your timetable? Are you, are you looking for long term? Plus, are you committed no matter what? <laughs> but not just in a good days, but every day. And that means that employees need to be involved. So there's dramatic changes has to happen within this. And there's two problems I see. One, people don't know how. So if you have a company focus on profit all these times and not have a, any broader view to this, might not know how to do this. So these newcomers need to implement these things. And then the second thing is the CEO's jobs, you know, look at from the industry, industry is very short, like it's four years, five years, right? And you have to make a best mark as you are. And some of the investment you might, you might make might not have a return at the five, six years. This short-term view is really the reason why this is not taking off, because social involvement is not taking off dramatically. Fortunately, on refugee topic, you see the benefit day one, right. immediately. You hire it, whether in a, you know, you're a Pfizer, you're hiring a, a scientist, or you're a McDonald's, you're hiring someone working at Marriott, you're talking to somebody in your hotels. The second day, somebody's gonna go, oh, but these people are amazing. I, I talk to my friends, see your friends, they see it. It sounds like you think it's not just in terms of corporate culture and people feeling good about themselves and employee um, loyalty and so on. It's also profits. It helps. Big time. That's why this is becoming very successful. So if you raise the political noise, which is 90% is really not true and is disheartening, this is so good for business. That's why we have 400 companies committing because... Amazon did this and they realized it's just no brainer. It really is. Hamdi, I want to talk about your business, your number one yogurt sales in the US. And this is a company that you started in 2007. You've stayed independent and you've gone after the, the big food companies. I think you've become a billionaire in the process. How did you do it? Oh. <laughs> 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 I sometimes have to pinch myself and say, like, what happened? I think what I'm most proud is not that we built a company independently that close to $3 billion in sales. I sometimes tell the team, do you realize what you guys are doing every day? I mean, last year we grew like double digit in volume. We, our EBITDA grew almost 70%. Our margins are as good as any big companies, but yet we grow four time, five times, four times faster than anybody else. And... 
you, you, you said, well, how is this happening? Why, why this is happening? Now we have about three, 4,000 people working for them. So it's a fairly large company. And it comes down to this early promises that we've made. So everybody at the company is the shareholder at Chobani. You know, that's, that's another reason I would do IPO, just to make sure that you know, they have access to that. The food, for example, I said, I'm going to make the food that everybody can enjoy. Everybody. And it doesn't matter you live in the city and you have an access to fancy stores. But what if you are in the rural community, you walk into your supermarket, why can't you have a cup of coffee, a cup of tea? I'm sorry, a cup of yogurt. But you just bought a coffee, which is why it it's looks a like fr- I'm going to the tea You're business. You're thinking, too. it does look like you're, are you going to the tea yeah, business? Yeah. I, and I perhaps always, a soup business. Yeah, I always want <laughs> the Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have an no, the sky's the limit. <laughs> Why? Fran, Fran is obsessed with coffee. I That's can. Why yeah, she's Italian, got this conversation right? around I, the coffee. I, if you ever come to New York, you have to try La Colombe. Uh-huh. It's my other company. No, it's part of Giovanni. Founders studied Italian way of roasting for years before they launched it. And they call it La Colombe, uh, the dove. But if you think that that, that craftsmanship of Italian coffee roasting is really embedded in, in La Colombe. You won't see the difference. Plus the beans in that I In a can. I'm, I, I, need, I still can, need to be convinced, yeah. Javi, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I know you only do good things, so I will try it. <laughs> Any other categories after coffee? Or will you focus a bit on coffee and then see what you yeah, want to do? I'm, How I'm, big do you want to be? I'm having fun. I'm having a lot of fun. I'm focused on food. You know, I have this tent hat today. I have... La Colombe and Chobani hats, and those are the three hats, other than Fenerbahce, my soccer team that I love. In For those Turkey. who can't see, he's actually referring to a baseball cap he's wearing, <laughs> <laughs> not a metaphor. <laughs> uh, I love what I do, but I'm very focused. So uh, yogurt is going well. We launched oat milk, that's going really well. We launched creamers, that's going really well. Now it's coffee. Every time things are going well, you get yourself a bigger problem. You have to build f- plant, buy fillers, and fulfill the orders. So... I, I, I want to see this through going. But I grew up in a town, small village next to Euphrates River, you know, near the mountains. We were nomads, you know, growing up. But when it comes to yogurt, it didn't matter where you lived, what kind of income you had. Everyone had an access to a simple cup of yogurt. But when I was in the U.S., I couldn't understand that you had to be in New York City shopping in Whole Foods to be able to have a simple cup of yogurt. And you had to pay $3 to get it. I just didn't make any sense. And I thought, if I can make a simple cup of yogurt available everywhere, this could work. And it has. And it did work. It's not that people didn't want it. They just couldn't find it. And then you look at the, the big food companies and say, huh, I wonder if you knew that. And often it's not what you know. It's what you want to believe because it's easier to do it and maybe more profits do it. It's changing. Disrupting food companies, large food companies, is very difficult. I would argue technology a lot easier, fashion is a lot easier, even car is a lot easier. But disrupting a food platform in U.S., I'm not sure how it is here, as a startup and independent, staying independent is almost impossible. The requirement for capital is so heavy. As a, as a founder, by the time you raise so much capital, you, you only have five to seven years to sell it so you can make a return to the investors. And the buyers of these companies, usually big food companies, when they buy them, they just don't know what to do with them or they keep them quiet. So you end up eating the same soup, drinking the same coffee, eating the same yogurt and using the same coffee creamers. And the quality of food never changes. It changes slow, small on the natural side of things or maybe higher income people can find something better. But the first vast majority, food doesn't change. Would you sell to the UK? I tried. I came to here. I started. And it was an enormous amount of success. I was buying a factory here in the farmland. And the last minute, I lost it. Is it but it, what, is it the difficulty getting the factory or is it selling yogurt to the Brits? I think the, selling the yogurt to the Brits was convinced that it was working. Uh, we had to get a factory. And I lost that bid on the factory. So now, and then I lost the interest and I had to deal with some other stuff. But I made it to Australia. <laughs> and that's not easy. We are number sorry. one brand in Australia. <laughs> what is your take working in the States amongst other places? You are corporate purpose embodied, right? 
maybe three, five years ago, this felt like this was the only way to do business. Increasingly, every businessman would be following in your footsteps. And I think it's been a shock to Fran and I to see the backlash. And especially when you look at the macro politics in America and other places. And there's some argument that ESG is being scapegoated. It's not actually the real problem with some of these corporates. Can you give us your take on whether some of those practices in those big companies, they're there for good, they're not going anywhere. Maybe people will talk about them less, but they're not going anywhere. Or maybe there will be a slight rowback on some of these principles. Yeah. What do you think? I think the line is going in the right direction and it's making ups and downs zigzags. There's no other way than businesses being part of society and, 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 and solution to, you know, climate and, and humanity and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, maybe we take it from the most marketing and branding side of it and quietly implementing into the DNAs of the companies to get the benefit from it. And, and there are some companies that are doing that. I always come back to this, this idea. Nothing will happen unless the shareholders are saying, I'm in. And I'm in big time. Um, and that's a big decisions. And they have to be convinced that as a shareholder, that I'm a long-term shareholder, I'm convinced that this is good for the business and this is good for my return. And once they make that conviction, the rest is going to come really easy. And when the consumers make those choices from their likes, from their scans in the stores or purchasing, everybody follows. Everybody follows. Tomorrow's companies really actively has to be involved on what's in our mind, what's society's mind, and what's the solution, what are the obstacles and, and problems that we're facing. Being silent is not even okay anymore. Forget about well, not just participating. You're not going to be relevant, period. Hamdi, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. It's interesting to re-listen to our conversation, Fran. The thing, the thing since we did it, the thing I've reflected on is is this idea of the baby out with the bathwater on ESG. And, and, and all things ESG at the moment seem to be so untrendy. You mentioned those three letters, which I don't do often, I promise you. But, you know, everybody sort of agrees that it's sort of very much not the flavour of the month or the year in any way. Um, but then you meet somebody like Hamdi and you feel he was before ESG. He was, he's the kind of pure version of ESG. He is the, um, you know, he's still doing it. He's not affected by trend or, and he's not doing it. But he was very clear to us, Fran, that it was something that would affect profit in a positive way and was something that businesses and CEOs should be doing for, to help their business. So I feel that was refreshing, that latter refreshing to meet somebody who was still in the game and, you know, had been, you know, in the game for a very long time. Because I do find the sort of backlash against ESG quite, quite depressing because actually, you know, the three letters don't really help very much, but fundamentally it's longer term things you might do for your company that are strategically a good idea. And it was great to hear him lay out quite cl clearly why helping refugees in this way was actually also good for business. Yeah, it's interesting because he always put actually his employees before profits. Mm. And so that's made him quite popular. And I thought he was quite practical. So instead of talking about yeah. ESG or wokeism or things that, you know, these big lofty ideas that divide mm. society, he says, I, I needed employees. And Completely the main agree. problem with actually attracting these refugees is giving them transport yeah. to and from to come and work in my factories. And yeah. so it was very matter of fact and it was very, yeah. it was less on principle, but just on practical. Yeah. That was refreshing. And that's really why his business has grown to like a billion in five years. Absolutely. Um, I completely agree. That's what I found interesting too. Back when I used to do lots of uh, TV journalism and I went to the Calais camp a lot and I met um, lots of refugees there. And um, you'd meet these 14-year-old Eritrean kids um, who were persecuted in their country and they just walked from Eritrea, uh, give or take a few ferries and buses and so on, but walked to Calais. And you were struck with these kids and they were kids. At the time, there was a massive debate about, you know, were they pretending to be kids and so on, but the ones I interviewed were definitely children. Um, and you, teen, young teenagers, you felt they had huge drive and were absolutely nails. <laughs> they were just, you know, sleeping on on streets and walking and walking and walking just to get to where their, their mum and dad had said, go to this country because it's the best thing you can do for your life. So you can see when Hamdi then talked to us about why these were people with values that a company would want, that was what I was thinking about.
Thanks for listening to this week's In the City. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, if you like our show, please head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts and rate, review and subscribe. It helps people find the show. This episode was hosted by me, Francine Lacroix, with David Merritt and Allegra Stratton. It was produced by Summer Saadi. Additional editing by Rishi Bujekal. Special thanks to Hamdi Ulakaya.